Well, welcome to Favor City, and what a joy it is for me to be able to speak today. It goes without saying that Cindy and I are so blessed and um, uh, just so proud of Joseph and Kristen uh, for answering God's call to come out here. We uh, committed them to the Lord. When Joseph was a little baby, we stood before the church, and uh, our pastor, Aaron Fleming, said, uh, uh, you're, you're committing him to God's service and whatever God calls him to do, and if he uh, chooses to send Joseph around the world to share the gospel, you will not complain. But, but he didn't say anything about taking my grandchildren out here. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, anyway, we're so proud of y'all and so uh, thankful. Uh, when you're sitting in that seat right now today, what I want you to realize is that you're an answer to prayer. The folks back in Alabama, as Joseph began to share the vision to plant a church out here and to begin to see what that would look like, people in Alabama begin to pray and begin to ask God to produce uh, uh, other believers that would come alongside them with this vision to come and reach and disciple the lost. So know today that you are an answer to that prayer. Those that you have come to faith and have been baptized and, and begin your walk with Jesus, you're an answer to prayers of people in Alabama. And today we're going to talk about being strengthened by God's word. And, and, and Joseph has given me a passage in Psalm 119. And this series is out of Psalm 119. And we're going to be in Psalm 119 in some select passage and verses today. But also if you're, you're following along in a hard copy of God's word, I want you to also thumbnail. We're going to be in John 15 some. And what we're going to do is we uh, talk in uh, Psalm 119 about being strengthened with God's word. We're going to uh, move forward about 500 years later when Jesus is in the garden. And I want to set this up before I read uh, Psalm 119 in these select verses. Because Jesus is in the garden and he is uh, talking to his disciples. He knows within a matter of hours he's fixing to be put on trial. He's being uh, uh, put on trial for something he didn't do wrong. He's being put on trial for our sin. And Jesus has a few intimate moments with his disciples before he is dragged away to be crucified, to be murdered for our sins on the cross. And in this time, he gives a game plan to his disciples that the world will know that he is the living son of God. And, and so we're going to take the verses in Psalm 119, and Jesus answers the questions that the psalmist rises in Psalm 119. So let's, let's begin with Psalm 119, verse 25. My soul clings to dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told you of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away with straw, sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways away from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. In verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Father, as we have read your word this morning, and we have proclaimed that through your resurrection power, you have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. May you open our eyes today to the strength that we can have from your word. May you use this passage in our life to strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Cindy, if you would bring me the football in the South, uh, uh, particularly we, we kind of worship this game. In, in, in Alabama, uh, football is 365 days a year. And I had a dream well, one day to, to either play for Auburn or Alabama. And, and the neat thing about football is there's so many great spiritual illustrations in football. And, and the neat thing about football, as you know, is that this ball was designed with a purpose, right? It was designed to play football. This ball right here would be terrible to play volleyball with. It, it just wouldn't work to play volleyball. It was designed for, for uh, football. 
it would be a terrible soccer ball. In fact, there's only two players that can use their foot on this ball during the game, the kicker and the punter. And so really, I don't know why it's called football, but it is, it is for the rest of the world, it is American football. But this ball is a great game, but is a terrible God. And many of us worship uh, the people that play football. But nonetheless, this ball was designed around a spiritual law, around a physical law. And, and that law is gravity. We know that as the game progressed, it became more and more aerodynamic. But this ball is subject to the law of gravity. And, and it was designed for that. And this ball in the hands of a great quarterback can even defy gravity a little bit more than somebody else. And I want to say to you today that your life was created with a purpose. And when you get out of purpose, you're like someone, uh, like a football that's being played in another game. You were created to be loved by God and to have a relationship with God and to be in fellowship with God. He caught it. All right, here we go. You were call, called by God to be in a personal relationship with him, for him to pour his love into your heart every day and to be in fellowship with him. The next thing we understand is that God calls us into this relationship to send us out. You know, um, if you have uh, Raiders season tickets, you paid a fortune for them. I mean, you, 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 you paid a lot of money. You invested a lot. And, and at Auburn and Alabama, if you have season tickets, there's a waiting list. Uh, 25 grandmas have to die for you to move up on the list to get on the list to have season tickets at Auburn or Alabama. People are fanatics about it. And so you pay a lot of money. And the one thing you want to do, I know that uh, teams huddle up. And in, in defense, you know, you huddle up and you get the signal from the sideline and you call the defense and you break the huddle. On offense, they single in the play to the quarterback. He huddles up. And, and there are a lot of great huddles throughout the nation. I mean, you could look at a lot of teams and they huddle up and they look real pretty. And they look real good, but nobody pays a fortune to go to these games to watch teams huddle up. And today, as the church of God, we huddle up and we get around God's word. But God invites you in to send you out. And we're here today. He's invited us into his presence to be strengthened by his word through our fellowship to send us out to tell the good news to people. And that's what happened to Joseph and Christian at the University of Mobile. God began to develop that missionary spirit in their heart. And, and my heart is just blessed by these young people who stood up here today. And I can just wait to see 10 years from now the story in their lives as the impact that Faber City and coming to Las Vegas has on their lives. Because we're huddling up for one purpose. That's to be loved by God so we can go out and tell the world that Jesus loves them, right? We don't sit and we don't sit in the stands to watch a football team just huddle. We want to watch them play. And today we want to get our instructions from the Father. Now, in this passage in Psalm, uh, the psalmist is crying out. He has a cry, and, and really he has three main cries. He's crying out that God would teach him his ways. He has wandered from God's way, and, and he's asking God to teach him his way. And when we turn to John chapter 15, uh, we're going to see how Jesus teaches his way. And, and then he, he, he makes a confession. He says, my soul is weary. My soul is dry. I am, I am at the point of death because I have wandered from God's word. Uh, growing up, I had uh, four uh, brothers. I was the smallest of four brothers. I was the third uh, son. In 1971, I was 11 years old, and I was headed to Ladd Memorial Stadium uh, for a big game in the city. It was a huge game. It was Davison where my brothers played, two of my older brothers played, and the stadium was going to be packed. The stadium holds 40,000 in last stadium. It's a big old stadium that high schools gather in. And this was a very important game for the playoffs. This was even a bigger game because one of the reasons it sold out was the Tomanville Rattler Band. I mean, you've never seen a high school band like this. I mean, most of the stands emptied after the halftime show. People got there early to see the pregame show. The Tomanville Rattlers had orange pants, bright green shirts. The, the, the majorette would come out and high step 100 yards. He'd get a standing ovation before the game even started. People gathered to see the band. Well, going downtown, uh, I was in the car with my dad, and he said, John, he knew I had ADD upon ADD upon ADD. 
He says, son, you stay close to me. This is a sellout crowd. There's a big, huge crowd. Don't get separated from your father. Do you understand me, John? Yes, sir. And I had my little football with me, and as we got out of the car, we had to park away from the stadium. My dad had one focus. That's to get in there and see his son play, and I was just tagging along. I was supposed to be right by his side. I began to play with my football, and, and, and my football got away from me, and I went to look for my football. My dad was focused on getting in the game. He had already given me my ticket. It was for 11-year-old and under uh, entry into the game. I was 11 years old, but I was six foot tall. I was a big guy. I was a big guy. And so uh, I had gotten separated from my father, and I looked at my father and said, I better run to the game. So I run to the gate, and I get up to the gate, and I see my dad going up those, you know those long, those long, I mean, he's a long way away. And I get up to the gate, and the man says, son, you ain't getting in. This 11-year-old ticket, you're 14 years old at least. You're a big boy. You've had a lot of biscuits. You've been putting butter on those biscuits like Cannon yesterday. He just sees his grandfather. Poppy, why has you got such a big pooch here? Uh, it's buffets and biscuits and Chick-fil-A milkshakes. We sent some missionaries out here to show y'all what food's about when we sent you Chick-fil-A. So anyway, uh, I'm at the gate. And this man says that he starts to define my identity. You're too big to get in. There's no way. You're 11 years old. You can't get in on this ticket. And just like we're old Pharaoh, I cried out, Dad! <laughs> come get me and my dad heard his son's voice a long way off and he looked around and he said to the man let my 11 year old son in you see I was separated from my father's identity when I got out of his presence and God's word today wants us to not be separated from the identity we have from our father and 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 the psalmist has has a desire he says uh, Father, teach me to, to run away from deceitful ways. And to see the thing about God's word and God's strength is that Satan is a great deceiver. He's the great counterfeiter. He, he takes God's word and he counterfeits it and he tries to make your identity something that it's not meant to be when you are fully walking in Christ. He's the great deceiver. And so when we get separated from the identity of our Father, we lose access into the game of life to fulfill our purpose that we're to fulfill when we're full of God's identity for our life. And so with one sound of my Father's voice, the man let me in to participate in the game. It wasn't long after the game was going and the great uh, pregame show and the great halftime show was going on that the Tomanville Rattler Band was amazing. I began to wander from my father again. He was up top. He had his binoculars. He was eyes were on his son, but I began to wander away from my father again. I got down and I was uh, focused on my brothers and on the Tomanville Rattler Band, and I was down way afar from my father. And, and all of a sudden, shots fired in the stadium. And the ground, uh, all the players hit the ground on the bench, and everybody in the stands began to wander. And right there, 11 year old boy, a man shot in the stomach, walked right by me. And I was in the presence of evil because I had wandered from my father's presence. You see, God's word strengthens us to help us discern and give us revelation about the deceitful ways of Satan and how he wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. How he wants to plant thoughts that don't confirm our identity from our heavenly father. And so let's fast forward for a minute and let's go into John 15 because God wants to give us a royal identity as his sons and daughters in John 15. So let's pick it up at verse 5 in John 15. And Jesus has his disciples gather in John 15 he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whosoever abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And that branch are gathered and thrown into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciples. You see, God gives us a game plan here to seal our identity in him. We got to think about this vineyard for a minute because this vineyard is very special. In the first verses of John 15, uh, Jesus says that my father is the vine dresser. He owns the vineyard. 
and he paid a great price for the vineyard. And there's three roles in this vineyard. Uh, there's the father who is the vine dresser who prunes the branches to make it even more fruitful. There is the true vine, Jesus Christ, that gives life to the branches. And Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. You've got to understand your role. I'm inviting you into a very intimate relationship. I'm inviting you into a relationship with me, my Father, and the Holy Spirit. Because he says, if you abide in me and I in you, and he abides in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you said yes to Jesus, you followed in baptism, then he put the Holy Spirit inside of you. And he gives you that power. And the Holy Spirit not only gives you power to live out God's word in your life, but it teaches you God's word. And, and what was an amazing uh, uh, transformation in my life as a Christian, I, when I went off to Auburn to play, play football, I left the homecoming queen of IMS, uh, all the beauty in Joseph and his good looks, it definitely comes from Cindy, and it goes from her, but she was a year behind me, and so I went up, and, and at Auburn we were on a quarter, and it'd be six weeks that training, football training camp would take place, and we'd be apart. Now, I know this is hard to believe for you young people, but this illustration is really important for you to understand because there was no texting. There was no timing. There, were, there, was, there was no cell phones. In fact, we had what we called long distance. That's how AT&T is such a big monopoly today. It was 50 cents a minute was a phone call. So the way we communicated back then was a good old-fashioned love letter. Oh, man, I couldn't wait to go to the mailbox every day, and I'd open up the mailbox, and there it'd be. Oh, a love letter written by him, by my Cindy. And I'd pull it out, man, and I wouldn't read it with the team. No, I'd go get along. I'd go get along, and I began to read all that mushy stuff Cindy was saying to me, all those wonderful words. Most of them were true, and, and I would absorb it into my life. I'd meditate on it. I'd smell that sweet perfume, and, and I'd get along with that love letter. And what transformed my life as a Christian is begin to read this book like a love letter. This is God's love letter to you. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts to steal your joy. In fact, it is an invitation to come in to the inner circle, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to abide in the vine. To, as a branch, you abide in the vine. You abide in His Word. Because here's what we got to understand. That God, to produce this vineyard, it cost Him a great cost. He has a great investment. we got to understand the Father's investment in the vineyard. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You see, for there to be a vineyard, for there to be a divine, God the Father. Before the creation of the world, it says that Jesus, it was determined that Jesus would be the slain lamb of God before the foundation of the world. Can you imagine that meeting in heaven? As the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit said, we want to create man, but we know that man is going to rebel against us. And to renew them back to fellowship, to renew them back to their purpose, to renew them back to their royal identity in our presence. That one day, my son Jesus, I'll have to send him to earth and I'll allow him to be born. And I'll allow him not only to be born into a time and place where crucifixion was the way of execution. You, you, you see, the father decided that I'll allow my son to be born into a Roman culture where crucifixion was the, the, the way of execution. That needs to resonate in our hearts today because Jesus could have been the sacrificial lamb of God through a less brutal death. But God said, no, we're going to enter that brutal time. We're going to enter that brutal time because I, I want the branches to know how much I love them. I want my children to know how much I love them. But I also want them to understand the decree in which I hate their separation and their sin. And so God decreed to the son, are you in on this? He said, yeah, let's do it. So God creates man in a garden, right? He gives them everything they need. He walks with them day by day. He gives them all this beautiful food to eat. And he's fellowshipping with them. And man chooses to sin and go on the one fruit that they couldn't eat. And they rebel against God. And then God begins to chase down mankind through the ages. He, he parts the Red Sea. He opens uh, their eyes to plagues. And he gets them free from slavery. And, and God blesses them uh, with manna from heaven. And he does all these miracles throughout the ages. And man will serve God for a while. And then they get comfortable in their blessings. And they fall away from God. And then God says, it's time, son. It's time, son. And he goes and he's not born on a royal palace with nurses and help, he's born in a cow stall. He comes to this earth and he has a humble birth, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that spoke and filled the galaxies with sky in the sky. 
And this Jesus is born in this cow stall and he comes to live a humble, uh, gracious life. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, he did that for you. You see, there's great cost to this vineyard. And that's why the Father says that if a branch is not bearing fruit, if it's not abiding in my love, it can't live this life of fruitfulness that I want it to. It's going to wither up and die. And just like the psalmist is saying, my soul is weary because I'm not walking in your ways. God is providing a way of victory through resurrection power. Because he's saying, you're going to abide in me because I am in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And my Holy Spirit desires to be in fellowship with me and my Father. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to read God's word like a love letter, then we begin to absorb his word into our heart. And what it does, it activates the spirit of God that he puts in us. As you read this word, and if you're having trouble not being filled with the spirit and not walking in the spirit, it's because we don't take time to read his word. And when we read his word, it activates the spirit of God in our heart. It says it like this in Roman. It says, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you become a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto your Savior. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in your thinking. That you might know what the perfect and pleasing will of God is. And so as we begin to read God's word as a love letter, it strengthens us through redemption. For God so loved the world that he gave. His one and only son for God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might have eternal life it's good news that God is redeeming this relationship and so as we go on in this garden we find something out about God's love there's a great cost to the father but the son enters the picture and there's a great cost we know to the son he's the one that's gonna to have to bear our sins the Bible says that this way that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that while we were unrighteous, we might become the righteousness of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. You, you see, both the Father and the Son have a great cost in this vineyard. That they're laying it on the line. And so we get to what I believe to be one of the most powerful verses in John 9, John 15, 9. Jesus says it this way, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. I just want you to think about that for a second. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. He's saying to Peter, James, and John, Peter's fixing to deny him three times and turn his back on him. The rest of the disciples are fixing to run. They're fixing to get so far from the fight, nobody sees them. They're, they're so scattered of their lives, once they take and drag you, they're a bunch of cowards. And yet Jesus says to a bunch of unperfect people with the same love that God loves me as his perfect son, I'm loving you as imperfect people. I'm pouring my father's perfect love into his perfect son, into a bunch of unperfect people. Now you remain in that love. Don't look to the world for love. Don't look to this world for satisfaction. Don't look for uh, dead ways of, uh, of bringing life to your soul. Your life is found in me and my love is found in you God's unconditional redemptive love is that we are seen as perfect in Christ man what a deal what a deal that we should abide in the vine and his acceptance it's his love in our lives and so the psalmist in 119 he says Lord teach me your commands that I might walk in them and it was a really impossible humanly speaking until the Holy Spirit came upon new believers to do this and here's the command of God. We get it right here. He says, if you keep my commands, you'll abide in my love. Just as I've kept my father's command and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my command to love each other as I've loved you. So here's the command of God. The command of God is he invites us in to this intimate fellowship to be loved as if we're perfect. Because we're redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It washes all our sins away, past, present, and future. And we come into his presence and he blesses us with a new identity as his chosen. And we are holy and blameless in his sight. And we're blessed, as it says in Ephesians, with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You got Jesus, you got it all. You get the Holy Spirit. The question is, you need to daily give all of you to the Holy Spirit. And as you learn to yield all of your life to the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like at home, you got a room. 
And, and, you, and, you, and Jesus is knocking on the door, says in Revelation 3, 13. He said, if anyone will open the door, I'm knocking. I'll come in and I'll fellowship and I'll dine with him. And you say, yes, Jesus, come in. You can come in my living room. It's looking good. It's all good. It's got, you got those movies off there. All right, Jesus, come on in here. I've cleaned up this room. I, I cleaned, but this back closet back here, nope, nope, got, no, can't go in there. It's really too dirty. You, you, you can come in all these other rooms, God, but back there, you know what? God knows it all. He died for it all. There ain't a messy room you got he doesn't want to enter in and clean it up. He's, he's already knocking on your heart's door when you're a sinner, when every room's a mess. He's saying, I'll come in every room. I'll clean it up. There's no surprises with God. You can't uh, sin so great that he isn't willing to come in and clean it up. He died for it. He doesn't want to waste his sacrifice. He's already laid down his life for you. Don't you think he wants to come in and fill every room of your heart with his Holy Spirit, with his presence? All you got to do is open the door. You've got to abide in him and abide in his word. And he says this. He says, if you'll abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you want and I'll do it for you. Now, now that's not health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not that F1 Ford 150 I want. You know, that's not what that means. It means that I'll have the desires that Jesus has when I press into him. When I take hold of the invitation to be in his presence, he will fill me with good things that will fill and flood my soul. And so he tells us, he says, I want you to love other people as I have loved you. And folks, that's why we're here. We're here to love one another with grace and mercy. We have received God's mercy as believers. Mercy is God withholding what we justly deserve, which is separation from him forever in hell. That's what we deserve. But God withholds that mercy and he pours his wrath on his son at Calvary and he bleeds and he dies a death for us so that he could have mercy on us and then he says this he, he says I'm not only gonna have mercy on you by withholding what you just laid at earth I'm gonna shower my grace on you that you might experience all my best and see grace is God's riches at Christ's expense we're now family we're now royalty we're now redeemed to do much more and so as we read God's Word we discover these blessings that we have in Christ we discover more of his grace we discover more of his mercy and it's kind of like this if, if Michael if you could bring up that passage in Hebrews for me Jesus is now our mediator because he knows that that deceiver is still on us every day God invites us in to send us out he wants us to love one another with the same love that he has loved us, unconditional, forbearing. And then he says it this way, greater love has no one this. He lay his life down for his friends. Jesus does it. And the reason he laid his life down for you on the cross is for this verse right here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we were yet without sin next verse let us then hold confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to find help in our time of need you see God wants us with confidence to come into his presence because he doesn't want to waste his sacrifice for you I mean he's already shed his blood for you and so he stands at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our great high priest, and he wants to extend grace and mercy in our time of need. He sympathizes with our weakness. He lived this earth, and he suffered temptation. Have you suffered rejection? Jesus has suffered rejection. Have you suffered in being lonely? Jesus was lonely. They despised him. They rejected him. He came with hands of love to heal the blind and open... Uh, take leper skin and heal it he spoke his word and raised Lazarus from the dead and what did they do to him they put a nail in his right hand a nail in his left hand a nail in his feet and a spear in his side and he hung naked before the world and he shed his righteous holy blood so you could be redeemed and then he resurrected power on the third day and he rose again so that he could make intercession for us and he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And this verse says we can come with confidence into the throne of grace and find what? Mercy and grace in our time of need. He's sitting there waiting. Amen. Amen. 
You need some mercy today? He's got it. You need grace today? He's got it. You see, that's the way God's word strengthens us as we begin to understand. We begin to abide in the vine. Let us close our eyes as we close the service today. Jesus paid a great price to be the vine. And, and he calls us into this relationship with him. And he's made all the preparations for us. He has a robe of royalty he wants to put on you when you come to dine with him. He, he has a robe of righteousness just as if you'd never sinned that he wants to dress you in as you come into his presence. He does not want you to be separated from your father's identity and presence. And he died. And he rose again to give you life and strengthen you with his word. If anyone, the sound of my voice, does not know that intimate relationship with Jesus and wants to know what it means to walk and be grafted into the vine and to know what it means to have that personal relationship with Christ. I'm going to turn it over to Joe right now and let, let him come up and, and lead the balance of this service. But the invitation, you're invited to the family. And God wants to do a work in your heart. Amen. We give it up for John Gibbons. I can't tell you how many times it was in a pregame talk or whatever with my football team and I saw dad's hands stretched out wide. Which, by the way, I don't know why you were surprised when I caught the ball. <laughs> I was a little insulted by that. But the love that he has for Jesus was something that I never questioned. And I've seen him morning after morning as a teenager when I finally woke up the kitchen table with his Bible spread out, marked up, mom's Bible right there. He loves the word because Jesus has carried him through. So give it up for my hero. Love you, brother. Hey, I don't know where you are today and we're going to get ready to close in, in song, but as we do that, you know, maybe God's moved on your heart like, hey, this I belong to this community, but today's the day I'm going to place my belief in Jesus. Today's the day that I want, that's real. You've heard testimony that it, it's, it's a real relationship you're being invited into. So maybe your step is to belong to community. Maybe your step is to place your faith and belief in Jesus. Maybe your step is to put your faith and your relationship on display through baptism. You're saying, I'm going to become a disciple of Christ, and I want to baptize. We've got an opportunity coming up the first Sunday in August. We're going to have a baptism service. You're like, I, I need to be a part of that. Whatever your response is today, here's what I encourage you to do. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. And if you have a response on your heart that you're feeling like God is leading you to make, I'm going to be in the back of the room. I want to talk to you. Kristen's going to be in the back of the room with me. Come find us. Say, hey, today's my day to belong. Today's my day to believe. Today's my day to become. Whatever it is, you respond as God leads. So let's stand to our feet and let's continue.